When you do these conversations about religion, the origins of religion, why do people believe, why did people believe, you hear a lot of the same stuff. I've been doing this since 2009, learning as I go and continuing to learn. And when you see you know, an angle, a tactic, an approach, a perspective that's enlightening, that's not something you've always heard before, where you just sort of hit the brakes and say, hey, wait a minute, let's examine this further. And that's what I've done with Dr. Hector Garcia's book called Alpha God, The Psychology of Religious Violence and Oppression. Dr. Garcia, thanks for being here. It's great to have you. Thanks for having me, Seth. Uh, I had read a description of your book, Alpha God. I'll just read a, a sentence or two. It says, the book focuses on the image of God as the dominant male. In Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, this traditional God is seen as a reflection of the dominant ape paradigm, so evident in the hierarchical social structures of primates with whom we have a strong genetic connection. Tie these things together for me right? The dominant ape and how it relates to the traditional God. Well, you, I started out trying to answer a question or a, a number of questions about religious violence, about religious conquest and oppression. And, uh, you know, uh, when you, I think a lot of social scientists focus on things uh, like politics or geography um, or poverty um, but they, they often miss the biggest predictor of violence of all, and that's, that's being male. So, you know, men perpetrate the vast majority of all kinds of violence across the globe. They start wars. They, they, they engage in infanticide and genocide. Um, they start fistfights on the street, you know, and, and, and even as you and I have talked about before, you know, spousal homicide. So, um, so, but I can it, already hear, I mean, I can already see and hear the people. They're like, wait, this is, this a man hating show. We're going to blame men for all the problems of humankind. Women never get into fist fights on the streets. Women never make decisions that are related to violence. You know, they're already checking out in their minds. They're like, Hey, wait, you're going to blame dudes for everything. How would you respond? Well, you know, I think, um, I think the best way to, to look at, at phenomenon, human phenomenon, which, you know, any, any way you approach it, there's, there are biases, you know, atheists have biases, Catholics have biases, Muslims have biases, but, but using the objective lens of science is a way to overcome those biases because it's got, it has mechanisms built in for that purpose. And the science is clear. I mean, come on, you know, men, men perpetrate a lot of violence and, and they they do so following their evolutionary drives, which I'm sh which we're going to talk about. But but then I started thinking, well, um, is there something common to the religions where violence and oppression are most concentrated? And indeed, what we found, what I found was that, well, yeah, it's it's religions where their conception of God is is based on on men. So. You know, one of the things about how God is described in the Abrahamic faith and not just the Abrahamic faith and other religions, it, it, he has all these, these resplendent powers. So, so he's omnipotent, right? So he has ultimate power. He's omniscient. He knows everything. Um, omnipresent. He's present everywhere all at once. He's everlasting. He never dies. Yet, this God seems incredibly preoccupied with very human-like concerns like establishing territory, um, sexual control, a sexual conquest, um, shows of deference from, from those lower than him on the hierarchy. Um, so, you know, why, why would a God who never dies, who doesn't need, you know, women or resources or territories to to uh, extend himself into the future like, like mortal beings do, be so preoccupied with this thing, these things. And that's because he's based on, he's based on men and, and you know, men carry forward their evolutionary imperatives into things like, like religion. I always thought it was interesting, the fact that in the church we saw the jealousy of God as a natural and even healthy thing. Well, of course he's God. Of course, he has the right to be jealous. No one else does. 
but God, Yahweh, Jesus does, because he should be the only one. He should be the only, he should have no competitor. And it always struck me as false, especially after I sort of eked out of the faith. Uh, why in the world would a being who had nothing to fear or worry about, really, why would that being ever be jealous? It reminds me of the Greek gods and all the human tendencies that Zeus and Apollo and you know, all the, all the Greek, the man-made gods of Greek mythology, they were all very jealous and conniving, and they had very human characteristics, right? You're right. You know, um, the, the, Yahweh is described as unequivocally jealous, and that's, that's true for a number of gods across the world's religions. But when we, when we try to understand jealousy in, in, you know, in the divine, I think the best way to understand it is by looking at at, at where that comes from, at, at the model, which is, which is men. And, and jealousy comes from the uh, sexual jealousy anyway, from, from male mate competition across a wide variety of mammals, a, a wide variety of primate species, including men. Men compete for mates. And one of the things that, that in that game men have to be preoccupied with in order to pass on their genes to future generations is, is, is being cuckolded. So um, spending time, re energy, uh, taking risks, trying to acquire resources to provide for offspring that uh, isn't yours. So, you know, women never have to worry about that because women always know whether a child is, is theirs. Um, not true for, for men. And so that selective pressure is what pushed male jealousy in, in men. And, you know, when we, when we, uh, when we uh, or sexual jealousy in men, I should say. So when we study jealousy worldwide, sexual jealousy is more prominent in, in men. And uh, that's definitely what you, what you see in, in male gods like, like Yahweh. And, you know, um, one of the things that I try to do in this book is um, look at look at behaviors in other species. And one of the reasons I do that is because oftentimes it's it's difficult to see our own instincts. Um, evolutionary psychologists Lita Cosmides and John Tooby, they were kind of the founders of this this one of the founders of this branch of of psychology called that instinct blindness. So, what they said was, you know, our, our instincts work so seamlessly and they're so old, they just operate mostly in the background. We're not aware of what's happening. One way to overcome that is to look at phenomenon in other, other species because it's always easier to see things in, in, you know, outside ourselves. So, you know, when you look at, at other primate species, for example, mate competition can be, can be violent, you know, um, uh, Attacking the rival male viciously, violently, um, sequestering his females. You see that in in baboons. You see that in other species. Um, in in chimpanzees, you, what you see is male coalitions doing that. So systematically targeting males from the rival chimpanzee troop, one by one, killing them off, and eventually absorbing all the females into the troop, um, taking over the territory. We see these same patterns in men. The prevalence of, of uh, wartime rape is, is staggeringly high. So when men go to war, rape is, is often endemic. And, and um, this ties into that, you know, our, our competitive evolutionary psychology. We also see these, um, these imperatives projected onto God. So... Uh, you know, in fact, in the Bible, God is reported to uh, have given Moses the command to do that to the rival tribes, to go into the rival tribes, slaughter all the men, and uh, take the women as your sexual spoils. And uh, many references to that kind of behavior. So, so I, think, I think there is a point to be made that that projection happens just look at his just look at Islam. You you can't get more blatant than you know if if you give yourself to jihad, and if you happen to die in the service of jihad, you're you're rewarded with 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 mates. You're rewarded with this battalion of of virgins. It's supposedly unspoiled too. I mean, they were reserved just for you, right? 
they were unspoiled, you know, which simultaneously addresses men's fear of cuckoldry, right? Virgins, by definition, come free from the genes of rival males. So, And I want to say, I would use the word unspoiled from the way religious or, you know, the radical Islamist sees it. You know, they are virgins, meaning they are sexually pure, and they are part of your divine reward. It's uh, It's very telling. Sure, and sexual purity really taps into into male mate competition. So you're you're assured to be not you know not r- raising another another man's offspring, which as we talked about, that's a concern of, of of males. You know, I think I think that that is um, that that kind of dynamic is you don't really see that in the in the in the mythos of, of Jesus Christ, but you certainly see that in Yahweh. You certainly see that in in Allah. You you see that even in hunter gatherer tribes, uh, and the depictions of their gods are usually sexually acquisitive. Now, you're working on a project now that talks about mate competition in relation to politics. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So you know, all these dynamics we've been talking about. And they they really apply to to leadership on on you know not only religious leadership um, but secular leadership how people how people regard their their you know the, the people in, the, the men in charge and um, so this project that I'm working on now is looking at mate competition um, in the context of political partisanship so. Um, so that's that's the next project. Wait, I'm now, what does that look like? I mean, I'm not asking you to give me the whole book here, but mate competition as it relates to political partisanship. I need more. So, you know, some scholars have talked about how liberalism has a very feminine flavor to it, right? Chris Matthews talked about that. He called he called the Democrats the the mommy party and Republicans the daddy party. So there is a there is kind of a you know gender undertones to our political partisanship, and so what I'm describing is why how do we arrive at that? And it turns out you know a lot of this has to do with our with our reproductive psychology. Wait, so you agree with Matthews that the liberals are more a more feminine party, however that's framed, and the conservatives are more masculine? Yeah, yeah, totally. And and you know there's there's also research looking at 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 um, our gendered psychology, you know, there, there's there's inventories measuring how much you identify with with uh, you know a masculine gender or a feminine gender. Now, what and, does that mean? I don't mean to keep interrupting, but I want to make sure that we're clear before we move on. Are you saying that the left is more what nurturing, uh, where the right is more of a, um, a I don't know a, a proactive sort of a chest thumping kind of thing? I mean, help me understand. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, you nailed it right there. So, so um, you know, and, and as you can probably imagine, you know, all this has implications for, for um, you know, how, how we were pressed to survive uh, across our species history. Um, we, you know, human beings do require nurturing, and they also require, um, you know, protection against the outside tribes. So, you know, Women, in, in you know, they're far more supportive of, of uh, you know, um, domestic compassion policies, social welfare, help for the poor, you know, um, things like that. And 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 men, you know, obviously are are far more hawkish and territorial. And so, what I'm exploring with this next book is the interplay between those evolutionary drives. Uh, and and political partisanship and how that how that uh, how that gives us the Donald Trumps of the world how that causes divisions partisan divisions and and what it all means the why of all that so that's what this project's about I had uh, read an article that talked about how and this was true in my case not to make this isn't a show up about politics but okay. when I was a conservative I thought more tribally sure. and when I became a lip when I sort of came out of the faith and then all those other dominoes fell, I saw myself thinking more globally. Does that make sense? There's, there's a, a pretty significant body of literature showing that, that, that focus it, it, it is pretty detectable across, across the whole world. You know, conservatives tend to be more, more tribalistic, more in-group, out-group, 
And, uh, you know, it's not hard to see how that could be a male evolutionary concern. Chapter three of your book talks about the protector God. All right. I'm going to defend the cave, going to defend the tribe, going to defend certainly our family. You want to speak more about the protector God? Why, why are we attracted to dominant males? And there's, there's no de- denying that there's, there's an attraction there. I mean, you know, you, you look at, uh, you, you look at things like um, like the history of who gets elected to, to, to the presidential office, and it's almost entirely the larger candidate. We like men who are big. Like physically larger? F- the taller candidate. Um, um, f- um, facial, masculine facial, facial features predict dominance um, in, in – or predict position in hierarchies and corporations and the military, things like that. So there's a draw to, to big men, you know, in fact, you know, in, in, uh, in hunter gatherer tribes, big men were often literally big men. They were, they were large because that, that, uh, that size often, often equates to strength and, and that's meaningful to primates like us that evolved on the savannas of, of Africa. That was, swarming with with dangerous predators um where you faced perpetual attacks from the outside tribe you know you you draw towards big dominant protector men um so so the idea is that uh you know these these functions these services are also projected onto our notions of god so God is described as as across religions as being you know protecting protecting often against against predators these ancient evolutionary fears that we have against again you know uh, the god Bess of, of Egyptian mythology he was supposed to be a protector god that protected against snakes and and other animals um, the God of Abraham too um, was in the Bible it talks about him protecting against you know actually literal literally, um, you know, predators that were present on the African savanna, like lions and wild dogs and things like that. So, so there is that pool. It's very old. Naturally, you know, if we're seeing God as an alpha figure, that's one of the things that gets projected onto God. And that's the intuitive appeal, I think, of having a God that's big, powerful, omniscient. It addresses some very ancient evolutionary fears that we all that we all have. Now, you brought up something in the book that I found compelling, and we've spoken about this in other ways, but you really put an exclamation point on it, that the villains, you know, God's arch enemy, or right. the enemies of these gods, often had physical characteristics of animals considered dangerous. Yeah, I mean, you know, Hollywood is really good at, at capturing this, right? I mean, how many horror films involve like a... Like an outside species, how many of them are animalistic? People l- like watching to that. It resonates with our evolved mind, and and you know, all, you know, often the the antagonist is uh, of, of of gods across the world's religions are are animalistic, including including at least Western depictions of of Satan. He's an animal. He has all these animal parts. Uh, he's male, so so I think this this speaks to some really old fears that we all have. Penitence is a staple of the Abrahamic faiths, you know? Bow before God, humble yourself, kneel, cover, you know, especially if you're in Islam and you're female. Uh, Can we talk about the idea of penitence, of bowing down, of submission as related to these alpha gods? Well, again, you know, you look at at submission in, in other primates, and one thing that I focus on is what what that looks like um it's it's fascinating to watch uh how members of of the primate hierarchy interact with one another um those lower on the hierarchy show deference by shrinking down you know they shrink down they bow down some of them even kiss the hands of the dominant the dominant uh the dominant male but but shrinking down and, and trying to convey smaller size is, is basically saying, look, I'm smaller than you. I, uh, I don't pose a threat. You know, in the physical world, size matters. You know, size connotes strength. And, you know, larger animals usually uh, subordinate smaller animals. Um, 
So again, this is another thing that we project on onto our notions of God, where God requires those same kinds of submission displays, very primitive, primate-oriented submission by, by bowing down, by kneeling, by making yourself smaller. Um, I mean, you know, just look at, at just go into a Catholic church and there's there's pews behind every bench for designed for that purpose. You kneel down before God. But again, the question, you know, it begs the question, you know, why would an immaterial being for whom size really doesn't apply require these things? Given the attitude of God, you know, he has this sort of uh, I don't know, it's, it's a, almost a schizophrenic attitude toward his own children. Love, punishment, love, threat, love, punishment. Um, and the church is supposed to love God while also fearing God. And I've said this in the past, and I'll present it to you. Do you think in that context that the church, the bride of Christ, could be a battered spouse? You know, submitting, uh, often encountering, or at least fearing violence, being commanded to love and being warned that you should never leave. This sounds suspiciously like, you know, a domestic partnership where violence is involved. Well, that's interesting. You mentioned the bride of Christ. I mean, that that is a doctrine, um, a Christian doctrine that 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 kind of feminizes followers and saying, you know, if you give your, you know, to give your 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 soul up to to Christ, you become feminine. You become his. Um, his, his, his woman, so to speak, and, and you don't stray from that. So all this stuff ties into these, these dynamics of, of, of mate competition, of reproduction, and how uh, men and women negotiate, um, negotiate their interactions around that. But, but you're right. Sometimes it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's based on, on possessiveness. And, um, and the God of Abraham is is described as being incredibly possessive, incredibly retaliative. Um, so, well, you know, he also considers women, you know, less valuable than men, you know, female slaves worth, worth less than male slaves. Women often considered the spoils of war, you know, sure. God's army goes in and they kill everyone except for the virgin girls, often preteen for the purpose of sexual satisfaction for the soldiers. I mean, God does not have a great opinion of women, right? Sure, and and you know, but but I think I think the point one one important point is is how how you know God is portrayed as dealing with infidelity. I mean, his you know, so, all, so the horrors that God rained down on the earth were in, in the Book of Revelations, um, and and you know, we, we don't need to go into incredible detail about that. You know what the, those are. Um, what could those have been about? Well, it, it, the way the Bible describes it, they were because of infidelity or because his his wives that were represented as Samaria and Jerusalem um, were in, in, unfaithful to him. So this idea of, of retaliating uh, against females for their infidelity, we see that we see that in men, as we've talked about, we see that in apes. So. Um, so you're right, you know, the, there, is, there, is this, uh, there is a certain quality of, uh, you know, sexual ownership. After all these questions up to this 30-minute conversation so far, you know, I, I'm a bit concerned that we have been sending the message that males are just knuckle-dragging, you know, uh, wild animals who have, you know, who are responsible for all the problems in the world. I mean, I, I'm speaking in hyperbole, but I'm doing so to make a larger point. Um, some might extract from the conversation we're having that, oh yeah, you know, it's man's fault that this happened and men are responsible for that. and Men have screwed up the world and men, men, men. Um, is that what we're supposed to extract from all this information? You know, all of the violence, the sexual violence, the territoriality, the uh, the creation of violent, sexually violent God myths, those types of things. Have men been responsible for all, quote unquote, all of it? Or what would you say to that? Well, um, 
you know, the science is pretty clear. And, and that's the thing about, about, about using evolutionary science to understand ourselves. You know, it can be, it can be unsettling. You know, it, it requires an unflinching look in the mirror at who we are. And that can be scary for people. But uh, in short, yeah, that's true. I mean, how can, how can we deny that, that, uh, that men are responsible for war um, or, or, or oppression, you know, or that they commit rape? They do, you know. Not all men do, and there, there are, you know, some men rail against that. Now that's but, where I think where I'm leading is how do we fairly address this very complex issue? And I'm, I'm not trying to knee jerk because I'm a guy. And I'm desperate to defend the gender. I mean, I want to speak about it honestly. But as someone who does care about, you know, people and who, you know, wants to stand against violence and war and all those types of things, and I know a great many men who do, how do we jive that with this notion that men are so often products of our biology alone? Well, I think I think it, we need to just reconcile with with where it comes. We need to understand where it comes from. And I think, um, you know, looking at its origin can help us make more rational decisions. Um, if we're just acting on, on impulse, if we're just acting through, you know, the force of these ancient evolutionary dynamics that create behavior in us without thinking about where does this come from? Um, you know, that's, that's, that's not a good thing. So insight into the evolutionary sciences, I think, can help us make better choices. So um, I can hear, know, though, I can hear the Ken Hams of the world saying, listen to these non-believers in God. They're saying that they're nothing but just violent animals. They're nothing but violent apes. They admit it. Uh, and they can take that football and just run with it, right? Well, you know, just as religions are capable of great compassion and 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 unity and you know selflessness, um, so can 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 men be capable of all these things? It's a mixed bag. So focusing on on one aspect of male psychology is not to say that is that that's you know that's a it's that's a unifying description of who we are, well, but can it I is camp out there. I mean, I, you know, the positive attributes of the evolved male primate and yeah. we get into, I mean, some of that, because I, again, I want to rail, I, I'm already dreading your inbox and I just want to apologize, Dr. Garcia, because you know, you're going to have those people who are like, you know, it's a blanket statement. It's an overgeneralization to, to say men screwed up the world period, which is how many people are going to receive that. Uh, that have you never seen a female who has acted in an untoward way or been violent or been sexually violent or who has abused a child or who has been warlike? I realize that it's, it skews heavily male. I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to make a false equivalency. But I, I worry about generalizations. I worry about overgeneralizations and, you know, people thinking that we are speaking in sort of these clumsy, broad terms. So, you know, help me out with that, Dr. Garcia. Well, you know, and, and you're, so do you think those would more likely be men or women? And they might easily, more likely, statistically be men. Yeah. But, you know, is there a shade or a side to the evolved male primate where how the men have evolved have been positive, have been constructive, are good for the world? I mean, is there anything left? <laughs> you know, that's probably where I'm going with that. I, I'm looking for, a, you know, a light at the end of the tunnel. I'm looking for the silver lining. Sure there is. Sure there is. I mean, like, like I mentioned before, I mean, we're capable of, of a wide range of behaviors, some good, some bad. And, you know, I think, I think uh, to a certain degree, part of me wants to say, well, suck it up, you know. <laughs> that's, that's, this is, who starts wars, you know, who starts genocide, you, you know, I think, um, committing those kinds of atrocities you gotta you gotta take stock in it you gotta take responsibility for it I'll you buy know? That. and and see where it comes from you know because because it comes from a very primitive place and if we don't understand that where that comes from are, are we are we more or less doomed to repeat it yeah. so if we were to create a god in the 21st century do you think it would be all that much different than the gods created back in you know 
1000 BCE? I mean, what do you think? I know we're speculating. Uh, who, who's to say? I mean, uh, you know, one, I, think, I think one of the reasons why the Abrahamic faiths are so widely practiced by over half of, of the world's religious practitioners is because it's so intuitive. It's so intuitive to the primate brain. You know, we, we, these tales of protector gods, of sexually jealous gods, of, of territorial gods, that resonates with us somewhere back here. And, and we're drawn to that. You think that one of the reasons that so many women participate in a church that posits an alpha god is because they are biologically responding to that, just as you know, we would see in the animal kingdom? Are they responding to the strong male, the protector male, the dominant male? Sure, I think I think both men and women respond to respond to that to that image. You know that the the presence of of dominant males was such a, a pivotal force in our survival uh, across our, our 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 primate evolutionary history that that we developed uh, you know mechanisms designed to navigate interactions with him to to submit to him to negotiate with him so um in the end you know men and women both both respond to that image of a powerful male and, and um um you know uh the catholic uh you know the history uh, it, there's a lot of there's a lot of women in 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 the history of catholicism that described having this sexual relationship with jesus it's it's very ecstatic you know so so does it also tie into female reproductive psychology? Of course, yeah. So let's finish on this note, and I'm going to link to the book in the description box. But, you know, you don't see the, um, you know, the primates on the African savanna sitting around in sort of a haze of self-awareness. They're not having a conversation on Skype the way that you and I are, trying to better understand human psychology Right. how we got where we are, where we might be going. You know, we're not seeing the uh, the ape philosopher in this way. In this way, human beings are different. Is our self-awareness and our ability to explore these issues as as higher primates and as, you know, beings who are able to, we possess this kind of cognitive ability, can we transcend in that way? And have we, in some ways, transcended our biology? You know, how does our self-awareness affect the whole game? Well, you know, as a clinical psychologist, I can tell you there's there's great potential in understanding unconscious or subconscious phenomena and bringing it bringing it under the, the the light of scrutiny. And there's definitely hope for that here, and that's kind of the intention of this book. The more we understand what drives our behaviors, the more we can make rational choices to engage in them or not, or not engage in them. And there's there's all kinds of ways that we transcend our biology. Um, just look at eyeglasses. Just look at sunscreen. Just look at the automobile. You know, that's these are all ways that we've transcended uh, the card that that our genes dealt us. So there's there's great potential in understanding. I think. I thought you know I considered for just a half a second throwing the th free will question at you, but I just have decided that's a whole other hour, <laughs> right? I've seen all these debates of people talking. Are you a determinist? Do you think we genuinely do have free will? Are we sure? Are we locked into our brains? Is you know is it going to go the way it goes? Regardless, we just have the illusion of free will. And I thought you know I'm not sure I want to subject anyone. <laughs> You want to go on record? I mean, do you think it's we have? An, uh, you know, sure. It's kind of a hard question to to, to answer. I, I mean, I, at the end of the day, for me, we still have to act, even if we are hardwired. We still act as if we have free will. There still have to be there still has to be societal consequences for negative behavior. We still have to try to promote positive behavior. So, at the end of the day, I mean, it's an interesting sort of an abstract question, but we still have to act. We still proceed forward as if we do have free will, right? Yeah. Yeah, and look, you know, there's, you know, there, there's no saying that just because we acknowledge that we have certain evolutionary arrived at impulses that we have to that we have to act on them, but but before we can we can make better choices, make more conscious choices, we have to understand what's happening, 
And, uh, you know, for that reason, I'm often, I'm often, you know, talking about the value of, of evolutionary science and how it should, should have a protected place in the conversation about who we are. And, you know, I live in Texas where, where that is a, a real fight for that place in the conversation is, 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 is happening now. So, you know, if we dispense with that science, then that leaves us, uh, you know, in a darker place. But the Texas Board of Education, I, we just shake our heads in the oh. rest of the country. We're just yeah, like, shake in my head. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I hear Aaron Raw going down there to give his presentations. I lied. That was not my last question. I have one more. Uh, sure. Let's yeah. talk about the yeah. civilized human being. Right? You and I are civilized. We abide by rule of law. We don't give in to our darkest impulses, whatever they might be. You know, we we aren't out of control. No. But do you think that human beings sort of under the surface, you know, do you think we all have that Jekyll Hyde thing going on? Do we all have an uncivilized part of us that is lurking under the surface? Is that even the right way to frame the question? Help me out with civilized human beings. Sure. Well, you know, the thing is, there's, there's a ton of research looking at, at how safe we have become and how civilized we've become since the age of hunter gatherers where where it, it really was you know murder warfare was really endemic in in our lives when we were hunter gatherers i mean some studies of hunter gatherer tribes find that up to 30 percent of all men are wiped out by male violence you know so we've been getting progressively safer and safer and safer um, Steven Pinker right, has written an excellent book kind of summarizing the science of that uh, called The Better Angels of Our, of Our Nature. Um, but, you know, part of that is, is our access to resources. Um, you know, we, you and I have the benefit of, of living in a society that's not, that's not torn apart by warfare or sectarian violence, that where the, the fear of starvation is is virtually non-existent here you know who knows what would happen if if we didn't live such a cushy life and we really feared for our our survival daily um so uh so so yeah do we do we have that all in us sure but again we also have in us uh the the capacity to be constructive and pro-social and compassionate dr hector garcia he is a clinical psychologist. He has authored the book, Alpha God, The Psychology of Religious Violence and Oppression. I will include the link to that book in the description box. Do you have a website or a specific resource for any of your other work or just the book link? Yeah, hector-garcia.com. Fantastic. For your time and for your perspective, it is greatly appreciated. Thank you, sir. Nice talking with you, Seth.